Mr. Marx, it is a great honor having you with us today. The reason for today's interview is to help entrepreneurs think independently and not lose their way. You being so successful, we want to share your wisdom with our young listeners by solving a little entrepreneurial challenge today. How did you get into finance and in the process, what made you write the most important thing? That's a big question to start off with. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, my father was an accountant. I took accounting in high school. I liked it. I thought I would be an accountant. Uh, so I went off to uh, Wharton School. Uh, where I was introduced to finance, which I liked better. So I switched to finance, and then uh, uh, at University of Chicago, specialized in, in investments, and uh, had a summer job in investments, and enjoyed it, and liked it, and stayed in investments for the last 50 years. Um, and, you know, uh, the education at Wharton, with Chicago produced a great uh, juxtaposition of uh, uh, theory and practice. And uh, I was very fortunate to get that education and uh, the uh, practical aspects of being an investor uh, caused me to think about the uh, theoretical things that I had learned at Chicago and the, uh, as I say, the juxtaposition of the two uh, led to the development of my philosophy. Uh, in, in 1990, I started to write memos to uh, our clients and I always thought someday I would turn them into a, a book when I retired. Uh, and then uh, in uh, 2010, uh, instead, I wrote the book uh, a little ahead of schedule and, uh, you know, because everybody says, well, what's the most important thing in investing? And, and the truth is that I found myself uh, with people uh, and I would say the most important thing is not losing money. The most important thing is controlling risk. The most important thing is buying cheap. And uh, the truth is that in investing, there is no one important thing. Uh, there are many things, each of which is the most important thing. And so I wrote the book that you're referring to, and each chapter says the most important thing is, and then it's a different thing, uh, because there are many things which are essential. So essentially, you were preparing yourself and organizing your thoughts in order to deal with the marketplace. Is this correct? Well, I think that's a good way to put it, yes. Mr. Marx, here's the challenge. Both of us are sitting on a bench, and in front of us is a little girl called Sarah. Sarah guards a bridge that can help us move to the other side. Sarah is a very special girl because she has the ability to give you everything you want, but you have to serve her. You have to know what she wants. The other side of it is that if you don't figure out what she wants and you don't serve her, you will lose everything. Mr. Marx, Sarah is the marketplace. You talk a lot about dealing with uncertainty when making decisions. Can you run us through your thought process when making a decision? Well, it's a very broad question, making a decision. I mean, uh, you have to assemble the facts, you have to interpret the facts, you have to understand the different choices you face, you have to understand the consequences of those choices, you have to be able to uh, understand how uh, the current environment makes each of the choices appropriate, you have to understand the probability of each outcome uh, to the extent you can. Um, and uh, you have to make a decision. And by the way, there are many different decision rules in the world, but you have, I would say you have to make a decision which has a, a good probability of giving you what you want and a low probability of, of uh, getting you killed. Your strategy of removing the bad seeds from the bell curve, it, all, it improves the overall performance of the group. But doesn't this mean you decide from the start never to be aggressive with one of the elements of the group, even the most promising one? Well, that's right. I mean, as I said, every, everybody has to decide, number one, what, how they define success. Number two, what will lead to success as they define it. Uh, you know, what, what we have strived for over the years and what our investors come to us for, we think, 
is uh, a high probability of good success rather than maximization at the risk of failure. So, so, so th th this is why to us and to our clients it's, it's important to cut off the left-hand tail of the probability distribution. That doesn't mean it's the right thing for everybody. Human beings are very biased in their judgment. Do you believe that entrepreneurs and investors lose their way because they are always looking for the unicorn and don't protect their downside? Well, I think that, I, I mean, I would never, you use words like always. I would never use a word like always. A, 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 a lot of investors are, are uh, captivated by the idea of getting rich uh, and having a big score and don't understand uh, that with the, tr the attempt to get rich comes the possibility of getting broke. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so, so, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in, in, uh, great strokes of genius that will make me rich. I'm, I'm interested in consistent success. And <clears throat> in order to uh, achieve consistent success, I think you have to, um, uh, not go for the what we call the game changers at the risk of being uh, wiped out but you have a, to have a solid analysis model in place with the metrics that must be fulfilled for a possible investment otherwise you keep stuck on the analysis paralysis how long does it usually take you to make a decision regarding what to do when once you have everything in place when you well when you say when you have everything in place, by that do you mean you've completed your analysis? Yes, what I was saying was most people get stuck on the analysis paralysis. They keep going back and back and eventually they do nothing. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a quick decision maker. Uh, my decision process, once as you say you have everything in place, which is an understatement, of course, takes a long time to get everything in place and a lot of work. But once you have all the facts and have performed uh, analysis uh, of all the facts, uh, it, it doesn't take me a long time personally uh, to, to make decisions. Now, I don't make a lot of investment decisions for the Oak Tree clients anymore. My uh, real job at this point is mostly uh, uh, leading and and uh, contributing to the direction of the firm. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that I'm a rather quick uh, decision maker. But it seems to me this is, this is always a dual system, you and the marketplace. You have to understand yourself and improve yourself. On the other hand, you have to understand your perception of the marketplace. It can be improved, but it's never perfect. But Given this higher degree of uncertainty, this also means that even well thought out plans might not work. So how do you improve your ability to get what you want and don't miss it by a mile due to some unforeseen circumstances? Well, number one, it's possible to, to uh, select the, the courses of action which are less sub subject to the unforeseen. Uh, some things, you know, I think you said before that everything is subject to uncertainty and to the unforeseen, but everything is not equally subject to those things. Uh, some things are more predictable than others. And if you, uh, if you have an aversion to risk, and if, if, uh, it's possible to, to select courses of action which are less uncertainty less uncertain and less subject to randomness. There are more and less so. Uh, and uh, remind me of the first part of your question. What I was saying was you might have a well thought out plan and due to some unforeseen circumstances you might miss it by a mile. Oh, so what I wanted to say is <clears throat> 
it's important to understand that some things are more certain than others. Some things are more subject to uncertainty than others. Some things are more subject to randomness than others, or to luck. And uh, some of your judgments are more likely have a, a have a narrower range of outcomes between success and failure than others. And it's extremely, you know, it's one thing I believe very strongly is that. Um, most people make decisions about the future based on their forecasts or their uh, expectations or their beliefs uh, in what will happen. And I think it's extremely important to have a, a belief about what will happen and then to have a judgment about the probability that you're right. Some, some forecasts or statements about the future are more likely to be correct than others. And we should not act as if all of our expectations are equally likely to be correct. Uh, and you, ha you have to have uh, a sense, you know, this time, okay, now I think this will happen and I think there's a 60% chance I'm right. Now I think this will happen, and there's a 90% chance I'm right. Uh, you have to understand the difference. And if you can have a, an appropriate feeling for the difference, I think it can be a good advantage. Not everything is equally likely. Or e uh, even though everything is uncertain, not everything is equally uncertain. But you must be ready to switch when what you are doing is not working. But at the same time, you, you must have some beliefs. How long do you stick to it until you see that you must change course, regroup, and take another action? Well, that's it. That's a great example of a question to which there's no answer. I can't tell you one week, three weeks, 10%, 30%, $10, $30. There's no, you know, on the one hand, if, 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 if one did not think that one had an above average to make these decisions, <coughs> then you shouldn't be an active investor. If, you're, if, you're, if your decision-making ability is, is average or below average, you should not be trying this business. You should be doing something else. So we're in this business because we think we know better. But if we think we know everything, then we're idiots. So it has to be somewhere in between. And so let's, let's take the same concept and, and apply it in a different way. You buy something and it goes down. If you think, oh, the market's telling me I'm wrong, I should sell it, then you'll be a disaster because that means that everything you buy that goes down, you'll sell. And, and, and take the loss. It means you don't believe in, in your judgment. So, so that's terrible. But on the other hand, if it goes down and down and down, and regardless of what happens, you say, well, you know, I know better, the market's an idiot, and uh, uh, I know better, then, then that's another way to lose a lot of money. So you have to strike a balance between belief in your opinions and understanding of your limitations. And there's no way for anybody to tell you where that balance is. You, 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 know, you said to me, at what point do you conclude that you're wrong? And you, it, it can't be subject to a rule. You know, I wrote a memo a few years ago. Maybe it was September of 14, I think, called uh, It's Not Easy. And um, you know, I, I was once uh, with Charlie Munger, and he said to me, none of this is easy, and anybody who thinks it's easy is stupid. And one of the things that makes these things difficult is that, that your question can't be answered. These things cannot be reduced to uh, an answer. 
I can't tell you, as I said before, if it goes down 10% sell it. Or if it goes down 20% sell it. Or, you know, or 30%. Uh, if it goes down $2 sell it or $4 sell it. It, it. There's no rule. And that's what makes this business difficult and interesting. Uh, if, it, if it could be reduced to a rule, then we could have a computer do it. And we could all... Uh, uh, you know, hang out in in Kaskaish, uh, uh, but uh, but it wouldn't be very rewarding. Howard, the old wise man is today's fool. You talk a lot about the innovator, the imitator, and the idiot. The first one fulfilled the market need, and he solved what Sarah wanted. But the last one is essentially useless. Sarah doesn't need him, at least doing that. When going about serving a market need, if you had to, to do it all, all over again, if you had to start over all over again, and everything was the same like it is today, Oak Tree Capital and all its peers are already establishing, so they are already fulfilling what Sarah wants, what the market needs. So it must be something better, because the established companies are usually pretty good at what they are doing. But you must remain in line and truthful with who you are as well. How would you approach your investment career if you had to start over all over again? Well, you know, I'm not... Uh, I, I respect your question, but I'm not given to that kind of thinking. I don't think too much about the past. And I don't think too much about the future. Einstein said, I don't think about the future, it'll come soon enough. Uh, and I don't think about the past, it's over. Um, the, the only thing I can say is that I like where I ended up. And if I change something in the past, it might, you remember the movie Back to the Future? If you go back to the past and, and you change the past, then it could change the present or the future. And I would be unhappy with that. I'm terribly unhappy. I'm terribly happy with the way my life has gone. And, uh, you know, I was thinking while you were asking your question, well, I could, you know, of, of my group of peers that I worked with at Citibank in the investment research department in 1975, six of that group these were my best friends at the time I was the last to leave so you could say I was sluggish and I was uh, uh, inactive I should have left earlier aha so when I left research I started up a high yield bond fund which turned out to be the greatest decision, which turned out to be the place to be for the next 40 years through today. Uh, so I should have left the research department in 19, before 1978 and, and started a high yield bond fund. Aha! There were no high yield bonds before 1978. I couldn't have done it. So if you, if you read the book uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. You, you know, he talks about demographic luck, which most of us would call right time, right place. And I was lucky. Uh, and uh, it happens that at the time that I left the research department, 1978, it, it, within a few months, I got a call from my boss who said, could you start up a high yield bond fund? It was luck. And, uh, and I was, I was, my contribution was that I was smart enough to say yes. But my, my point is, that was the time. I couldn't have done it at another time. Five years earlier, there were no high yield bonds. Five years late, I would have been just another John, Johnny come lately. So uh, I, I don't, I, I practically never think about what I could have done better. Although luck plays a part, you kind of make your own luck, right? Because you're the ultimate responsible for the decisions that you make. Well, I, you know, I don't use that expression, you make your own luck, because that suggests that if you do A and B and C, then you don't have to worry about luck. And I don't agree with that. Luck happens. Stuff happens. Success is how, we, how the things we do collide with the environment. And the environment, at a given point in time, is largely out of our own control. Um, so I don't like the expression, we make our own luck. The point is there are lots of people, well, 
the harder you work and the better you work, the more likely you are to do well in any given situation, whether it's a lucky one or an unlucky one. And so you might say from that you make your own luck. But you can work really hard and not run into a lucky environment and be unsuccessful. Or you can be a slouch and not work that hard and run into a lucky environment and be very successful. Now, somebody else who runs into that environment and works harder than you and better than you is likely to be more successful. But the point is, you know, my, my, one of my mottos is that there are three ingredients in success, aggressiveness, timing, and skill. And if you have enough aggressiveness at the right time, you don't need that much skill. But clearly, the more and the better you work, the probably the better you'll do in any environment. But that doesn't mean that hard work and good work is, is sure to produce success because of, the, uh, because of the role of randomness. So I wrote a memo in January of 14 called uh, Getting Lucky. And that was one of the memos that uh, had, maybe that was the memo that generated the most response of any in the last 28 years. And uh, I, I'm, I, I said in there, I'm a great believer in luck. And, uh, you know, uh, it, the, the memo was actually inspired by someone who, I read a quote, that success is never accidental. And I don't believe that at all. I think sometimes success is accidental. And, and sometimes uh, you're successful uh, uh, just because of, of luck. Uh, I think what we can agree on is that hard work helps and luck helps. And hard work and luck together is a hell of a good combination. Uh, I feel I've been very uh, lucky in my life, and I lay out in that memo probably a dozen ways in which I was lucky. And I don't mind saying it. I'm not embarrassed uh, to say I got lucky. And uh, anybody who does not appreciate the good breaks that he received in life, uh, in my opinion, is missing something. Howard, you had this very successful career. At this point in your life, what is the most important thing for you? Most of the most important thing to me is people. And it's my family and my friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get to my point in life and you want to enjoy your family and your friends. And you want to be a good husband and father and grandfather. And you want to be a good friend. Now, there's, there are other things that count, too. I think you want to be a good citizen. So you want to fulfill your responsibility uh, to the world we live in. And I try to do some of that. I still try to be a contributing professional. And so I'm still writing the memos and uh, working on a new book at this time that will be out next year. Uh, and I still want to contribute my thinking to the world. And I still want uh, the respect of my peers. Uh, and then, so that's number two. And then I want to enjoy myself. And I want to, uh, uh, you know, have relaxation, have beauty in my life, have activity, have fun, uh, have uh, in intellectual stimulus, uh, et cetera. So uh, there's no one thing. Uh, but I think clearly uh, uh, the people I love and, and having their love is the most important thing to me. Howard, besides your own books, can you share another one of your favorites with our listeners? Well, I, I, I mentioned, uh, or maybe I didn't mention, but, but uh, you mentioned Randomness and Luck. And it's not a new book, but uh, the book Fooled by Randomness uh, by Taleb, I think is a very good book. And uh, it really helps you focus. You know, I, after I read that book, I, in one of my memos, I wrote a section entitled, What's Real? And that book tells you that one roll of the dice, one number that comes up is not necessarily reality. It's just the thing that happened by chance at that time. And uh, in investing and in other walks of life, uh, we have to understand the difference between one observation drawn from 
the universe and the whole universe. And one observation or two observations uh, is not necessarily indicative of the reality. Now in our business what that means is that if somebody has one really good year or one really bad year, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a good or a bad investor. And uh, we have to um, we have to try to figure out the characteristics of the whole universe and not be overwhelmed uh, by the appearance of the sample. Finally, where can our listeners get a hold of you if they have any further questions? Well, I think the, I think the best place to go for answers to your questions is oaktreecapital.com, www.oaktreecapital.com. If you click on something called Insights there, you know, you have 28 years of memos that I've written, uh, probably uh, uh, over 100 memos, and I think that you'll find uh, something there on uh, virtually every topic. Howard, it was wonderful speaking with us today. Thank you for taking time and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thank yeah. you, Diogo. <laughs> Thank you.